Welcome back to the American Health Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the front lines, Surgeons Voices. With me today is Dr. Joe Beisky. Dr. Beisky is, of course, the Executive Director of the American Board of Surgery, with whom we've spoken in the past. Welcome back, Dr. Beisky. Thank you. Great to have you here. And what I'd like to do with you today is, is go through the kind of timeline as it might be for an individual person given a variety of encounters with the American Board of Surgery. Perhaps we could start out talking about the uh, American Board of Surgery in training examination, how that particular exam is being conducted with a virtual platform. Sure. So the in-training exam uh, was one of the last of our exams to sort of show cracks around COVID. You know, we gave it, we give it in January. So it was done before COVID really became an issue this year in this country. And the first we realized it was going to be a problem is we offer the in-training exam in, internationally as a partnership with several other countries, one of which is um, the Netherlands. And they called us and said that because of social distancing requirements um, and proctor um, you know, um, furloughs, they weren't sure they're going to be able to offer it. They usually do it in October and they wanted to know about rescheduling it or canceling it. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. Didn't see that coming. Um, and so they ended up canceling it. I'm not sure if they're going to try to reschedule it later in the year. They, they, they've been taking it for about five years. They do a modified version where they add some Dutch questions as well. Uh, and then we started getting phone calls from programs saying uh, that they weren't that they were not able to reserve their computer computer labs that the hospital wasn't allowing them to hold their computer labs um, that the ones that could had uh, restricted space and time uh, and a sort of increasing volume of calls around that not a lot you know maybe you know five percent of the programs were contacting us. Um, uh, but it became apparent that it might be an issue for some. And so we have first asked ourselves, will we reschedule it, you know, try to do it later in the year? Um, would we try to deliver it as an at-home exam, for example, a virtually proctored at-home exam, or maybe a not proctored exam? It's supposed to be a low stakes exam. It is for the purposes of the programs to understand how they're doing. It's not actually supposed to be used in the high stakes way that it is offered. So we briefly considered, you know, just offering it at home and maybe taking away the ability to have it used as a high stakes exam, essentially. But that didn't seem like a good partnership step with the fellowships and with the program directors. Um, and so the APDS uh, leadership polled their members and said, you know, what, how, how big is the problem and how many of you um, have a problem and what do you see as the potential solutions? And the, the most straightforward potential solution was they asked us to just expand the number of days that they're able to take it. They're normally able to take it over five days. Um, so we, we made it over 10 days, more weekdays because they're proctor, you know, they also have furloughed um, staff, so they don't have proctors on the weekends as much. Uh, and that was really our solution. And so far that was that was pretty well received. We're not gonna offer a makeup date. It's not actually required for residents to take it every year. Um, and uh, and we'll see how it goes. That's 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 the story with the in-training exam for this year. Uh, Singapore actually canceled their in-training exam last year. I guess that was actually the first shot over the bow that the in-training exams are gonna be a problem. Thanks very much. And I'm glad that seems to be working out very well with the in-service examination. I'm sure we'll get back to you in the future and hear about it, its progress over time. So the next step in the exam sequence for an individual surgeon would be the qualifying exam. Perhaps you could bring us up to date with the status of the qualifying examination. Sure. So uh, I don't remember exactly when we last spoke, but uh, I do know the timeline for the qualifying exam. And so uh, decisions about these exams, especially the written exams, have to be made about 90 days ahead of time. Uh, there's not a, it's not just a question of whether we send the questions to one company or send the questions to another company. There's a tremendous amount of IT background work and uh, back and forth of information. So even on a regular year, Pearson needs our questions at least six to eight weeks ahead of time. Uh, ITS, our other exam vendor, needs them 90 days ahead of time. So we were making the decisions about the July qualifying exam in April, end of April. Um, and what we decided was, was we developed some principles, uh, which included that we wanted to keep people's um, certification timelines intact as much as possible. People hold the month of July to take their exams. The month of July, a lot of fellowships don't start till August, so they have this space and time where they can study, move, get their exams um, over with. Uh, we know that people are more likely to do well with the exams if they take them early or closer to their training. So we wanted to honor that. And then people you know, like to get it over with and move on with their careers. Uh, that was one principle. Another principle was that as an exam organization, we were not going to, or as a health organization, we were not going to 
um, spread COVID. So we didn't want to have people gathering in public places, even though Pearson centers may be safe. We didn't want them traveling in subways. We didn't want them riding in elevators. And in April, when we were making these decisions, Pearson centers were closing all around the country. Uh, they had different rules and requirements and state by state. Uh, some of them had social distancing requirements. Some of them had cleanliness, air filtration requirements. Some of them didn't have any requirements. The requirements were changing week by week, state by state. And Pearson itself was in disarray. And they did not think, they certainly couldn't assure us that they were gonna be able to deliver the exam as scheduled on July 17th. So all those pieces of information, we decided that we needed to give the exam, keep the timelines intact, and we couldn't do it at Pearson Centers because we didn't want to spread the disease. Um, and so we took a step into virtual proctoring. When we turned to our usual exam vendors um, uh, for non-Pearson non Center exams, which is ITS, Internet Testing Services, we've worked with them for a decade. They're fantastic partners, leaders in the industry. Uh, they were very happy to do a web-based exam for us, but they, they did not have um, proctoring services uh, available. So they looked for a proctoring service company. We looked for one, and we, we both actually independently came up with the same company, um, Verificient, otherwise known as Proctor Check, I think, that has been in the field for you know, at least seven years um, doing artificial intelligence proctoring and, and more recently live proctoring. Anyway, make a long story short, um, although we partnered with them, the exam just was a fiasco on the day of the exam. Uh, people were, you know, the, the eight o'clock group mostly were able to get their exam started. Uh, people started the exam in waves. Uh, I think, I, 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 don't, I don't remember perfectly clearly anymore. It was about a hundred people an hour were supposed to start the exam. Um, so eight o'clock, most people got in, nine o'clock, many people got in, 10 o'clock, some people got in, and by 11 o'clock, no one was able to register for the exam. And it turned out there was just this chaotic background where the room checks weren't working, the proctors were giving confusing instructions, the software that had been downloaded didn't, you know, it was hiding the proctor or, or hiding the proctor chat so people weren't getting the proper instructions or messages. I mean, it was, it was a disaster. Um, and over the course of the day, we realized that not only was it a disaster, it was an unfixable disaster. We actually put the whole exam on hold for a few hours in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, Verificient thought they could fix it. They were sort of doing hot patches, live patches to the software, uh, and eventually it became apparent that that wasn't feasible. We tried uh, throughout that night, actually, I still had staff working at midnight that night, as did ITS. Um, to salvage it for the, some of the, some people actually did take the first half of the exam. Some of the eight o'clock people, you know, got in and got through. Some people didn't know there was even a problem. Um, but um, uh, it also became apparent that there was just no, we, we just couldn't be at all confident it was going to work any better the next day than it had the first day. Uh, we didn't think it was fair to have people have a half exam and not go on. And so we stopped. Uh, and that began about a six week period of figuring out what to do next. You know, the, uh, the candidates were, you know, ranged from, you know, being sort of um, fatalistic, like it's COVID, you know, this is unfortunate, to, you know, really, really distressed about the upheaval and, you know, the cost and sort of sunk emotion, time, studying, energy. Some people had rented hotel rooms to take the exam for quiet. Some people had sent their kids away. Some people had gone away themselves. All of them had really put their lives on hold. So they were uh, really very, very upset and very angry. The program program director sort of rose up in defense of them, but also in defense of the process. So we decided that, you know, the most important thing was to get the answer right. Um, and really, truly to stick to our original principles as much as possible. There, there were more principles that included adhering to our usual standards. We held town halls. Um, we had, I think, five open town halls for any resident who wanted to sign in. The first one had, you know, of the 1,425 people who were registered for the exam that day, I think the first town hall had about 800. The next one had, you know, 350. The next one had 150. And by the time we did the last one, it was down to about 25 people. Those were open question and answers. People could submit questions, we would answer them. That helped us understand what their issues were. Um, we had a roundtable discussion with members of the RAS, um, as well as members of the General Surgery Board and the Board of Directors. Uh, we had another roundtable with program directors. We did as much listening as we could, and we got uh, barraged with emails and phone calls um, and social media comments. And then eventually we had to make a decision. Um, and you know, er, their suggestions ranged from use last year's in-training scores to decide if people have qualified for the certifying exam to abandon the certifying exam, uh, the qualifying exam and just make the certifying exam the certifying exam. Um, 
uh, to everything in between, you know, double score the first half of the exam for people who were able to take it. Just all, there was a wide variety. Use program director testimonials. Uh, so we listened to all of those, and we ultimately decided that that you know the the value of board certification to a great extent rests on its consistency and reliability. That's what institutions like about it. That's why they require it in the way that they do. That's what insurers like about it. Uh, and to suddenly say, well, this group of people that we've already um, you know, limited the number of cases that they had to do and cut back on their time. We also skipped a test, but we say that they're okay. Uh, and we just didn't feel like that was, that would, that, that would not only undermine the value of their own certification, but certification across the board. And in this discussion, I didn't mention that, you know, we talked with other boards also. There are 24 member boards of the ABMS. All of them were facing challenges with their exams and everybody really agreed that the main standards had to be upheld, that huge changes like just deciding not to give an exam um, were damaging to the entire mission and purpose of board certification. So the short version is we rescheduled the, um, the qualifying examination for April. That was the earliest date that Pearson could give us. They are holding all of the seats in the country for just this group of candidates so that they can um, you know, be able to schedule more at their convenience. Sometimes there's a big last minute scuffle. People have to fly around to different locations. So Pearson was very um, helpful in working with us. We um, gave everybody a discount, a significant discount. The exam is usually, I think, uh, uh, now I'm drawing a blank. It's like $1,350. And so we gave a $400 discount in recognition of expenses that they'd outlaid, um, study materials, um, hotel rooms, babysitters. We um, gave them score for free for a year because people were concerned about their study materials being you know, out of date or unused. And there was a big issue, a, a concern about um, uh, security hacks, that they downloaded these apps from ProctorCheck, that they were now infesting their computer. A lot of people uh, noted that they had an increase in robocalls afterwards. Some of them thought their computers were slower. Some of them had reports um, uh, that someone had tried to sign into their Netflix account or to other accounts. And so we actually hired a cybersecurity firm um, they got all of the software, they tracked through all of the records, they took all of the complaints, and in fact found no concerted effort at security uh, interference. And, uh, and, but we still offered two years of ID monitoring, security monitoring, deep web monitoring uh, for everybody who was involved in the exam. So that was the resolution. We tried to mediate, uh, mitigate the problems that we had caused. Um, we upheld the standards of the board by maintaining the certification process. Uh, whether or not we're uh, spreading COVID, I think remains to be seen. I think we've learned a lot about it. Pearson centers have done a great job and have continued giving exams. They've, you know, adhered to social distancing and, um, you know, monitoring. And so we're, you know, cautiously confident. We also think that uh, even if some areas of the country are active, that it won't be the whole country and that at least, or maybe it will be, in which case the backup plan will be taking the exam at a later date. We're not gonna try another virtual exam. We're not gonna get creative with that exam. The candidates got badly burned by it. And I think that we also got badly burned by it and our relationship with uh, our diplomates was damaged by it. So we're, we're going back to tried and true. And we'll do what we can to accommodate what happens to the country around that. Difficult process, and it sounds like you've reached uh, the best possible solution under the circumstances. How, how about the certifying examination? The certifying exam, I think, is a happier story. Those pilots were useful. You might remember that they, we had 100% success with them with very small numbers. So because we canceled in the end three exams, two general surgery exams and a vascular surgery exam, we have about uh, 800 candidates who need to be examined this year, more than we usually do. Uh, so in a normal year, we examine about 2,000, a little less than that. And we're going to examine about 2,600 virtually this year. And we had our big, our first big one uh, two weeks ago. It was a general surgery exam. We examined, uh, we had 308 people register. 306 people were successfully examined. Uh, of the two who were not examined, one uh, just messed up the time zones and called in an hour late on the last day of the exam when we couldn't reschedule him. Um, and one had Wi-Fi problems on the first day. We actually rescheduled them on the second day because we held some empty slops in case there were technology issues. Uh, and although he passed his tech check in the morning when it came to actually taking the exam, he still had such bad Wi-Fi problems that we couldn't, you know, couldn't hear or understand. He's rescheduled for November. Um, so we thought that was pretty good. We had a document of tracking, you know, what we would consider success. Industry-wide, the failure of high-stakes events um, by virtually is a 
but reportedly between 10 and 15 percent. So we decided if we successfully examined 90 percent of the candidates, we'd be happy, and we were, you know, we were over 99 percent. Um, we have a, sent out a survey to both candidates and examiners. Uh, I haven't seen the final results, but you know, on the scale of one to five, if five is the best thing that's ever happened to me, the, those scores were all fours and fives, both from examiners and from candidates. There are differences. Um, the examiners find the days long. It's not as, you know, they don't get the social fabric of being together for their volunteer time. Um, the managing the questions, the candidate, the scoring on screen, I think is a challenge for them. Um, but we had a lot of practice sessions and uh, none of them seemed to think that that interfered with the exam. The candidates, it's pretty straightforward. They just log in one place, they get their ID checked and they get moved to another room and they stay in that room for the duration of the exam. Uh, so I think that that went quite well. I, it's, uh, I, it's hard for me to imagine that we'll go back to in-person exams. Uh, well, yeah. Interesting. And you mentioned scores. Um, if you compare this cohort of, of examinees who, who recently became diplomates, was there any difference between the traditional um, pass-fail rates uh, that you've seen in the last few years? So for the pilot, the pass rate was very high. Um, uh, we're usually in the sort of low 80%, you know, 83, 84% pass rate. And uh, for that group, it was like 96 or 97%. It was very high. It was a, a very select group of candidates though, people who were highly motivated, who felt prepared to take the exam on very short notice. Um, uh, so they were not our standard cohort, I would say. Uh, this group, it was almost exactly what it normally is. I think it was, you know, around 83%. So that was also um, very reassuring. So I haven't seen the final results of the survey. So I, and that and the comments will be interesting. And we have another exam in November, another one. We are giving an exam every month, basically this year to catch up between the general surgery and the specialties. Well, certainly it sounds like a good validation given, given that pass rate. Um, last question um, for you that when we last spoke, we discussed some modifications to case numbers and requirements for both general surgery as well as many of the other specialty uh, exams. COVID hasn't gone away. Here we are six months later talking again. Unfortunately, it's still with us. Uh, hospitals are, depending upon the geographic region, ramping up, ramping down, staying static. What happened to those changes? Are, are they staying? Are they at the discretion of the program? Have they uh, been erased and we've reverted to the norm? So those changes apply to the finishing chief class that's done. Uh, so they don't apply to any future group. And what we're going to do, whether we're going to reinstitute them again this year, remains to be seen. The specialty boards all met in September, and that was a topical conversation across the whole group. They all meet um, by schedule again in the spring at various times. Uh, but they decided not to hazard a guess about the impact of training uh, on this year's group. And they, they felt that uh, there was time to make up the deficits, um, it's certainly in terms of cases, for people who were not in their chief year last year. So I'm, I would say that if there is a big impact that we will likely do the same thing that we did last year. I don't think we're gonna get, let the trainees suffer uh, for the randomness of being you know, asked to stay home because you're in a, you know, a clean cohort for COVID. Um, interestingly, the ABMS and the ACGME came out with a joint statement, um, uh, really expecting the the three C committees to uh, to use sort of competency metrics uh, to cobble together competency metrics and as much as possible to meet board certification requirements, but to really start to lean on the judgment of those committees. And I fully support that. And I don't know if you know, but the board is you know hot in the middle of developing EPAs towards competency-based advancement. Uh, we've got five of them written. We're working on another panel of 20. Uh, we we're planning on starting to implement them in and for the entering class of 2023. So we endorse that idea that you should be advanced on the basis of proven um, assessments of your judgment and skill over time. It's just that those tools are lacking right now. So um, uh, if push comes to shove, that is probably the, that the, the opinion of the CCC, I think will weigh heavily in what we decide to do with an individual trainee. And, and for those listeners who may not be familiar with the term CCC? Clinical Competence Committee. Sorry about that. I, I live in a world of acronyms. It's quite shocking. I'm sure yours is, yours is the same or even worse. Um, so when, when the trainers, the, this fa the surgeon faculty um, evaluate the residents, those evaluations get funneled into one group that sits uh, every six months and goes over them. Uh, and they make advancement decisions and 
remediation decisions or um, routine advancement. So it's called the Clinical Competence Committee. Well, thank you for the definition for those individuals who maybe aren't working in academic medical centers. And, and thanks again for your time. Thanks for your leadership, of course, the American Board of Surgery. And I look forward to uh, speaking with you again at some future date. I suppose after the qualifying exam uh, is given in the Pearson Centers, we'll see how that goes. With Hopefully there won't be anything to tell. <laughs> tell that it went well. <laughs> Congratulations on your new role in the college, uh, and, uh, and thank you for having me again. My pleasure.